Why did we buy a 10 year old camera that can only record 2K internally in 2021? No IBIS, no autofocus, pretty much no usable onboard audio recording, nothing to write home about in low light. Well, there's a lot of Arri Alexa classics on the used market now and they're becoming ever more affordable. In this video, I'm gonna talk about why I believe this camera, the Arri Alexa Classic, is an awesome purchase for us, but may not be for you. Let's get into it. Before I talk about the pros and cons of this camera and what I think you need to weigh up before potentially pulling the trigger on one, I want to talk a bit about my perspective on high quality motion picture capture. I'm going to talk about how and why my views have evolved over time from being someone who would never, never even consider buying a sub 4K camera, not even back in 2015. So I've been working in video production for about 12 years. I graduated uni just before the 5D Mark II revolution. We owned two 720p JVC HD triple one E's that recorded 720p onto DV tape when the 5D came out. We leapt on it. Finally, we owned a camera that enabled us to shoot using interchangeable lenses without an enormous 35 millimeter adapter on the front. Going from a 1 13 sensor to a full frame one was a hell of a jump. Some years after that, we bought a barely used Red Scarlet MX, a 4K raw shooting beast for the time. We bought it in January 2013. That camera worked flawlessly until we sold it in 2019. I loved that camera, but not for the reasons I expected. You see, in 2012, I was convinced that we needed to go 4K. Anything less was a waste of money and not future-proof. What surprised me when I look at the first shots I quickly grabbed on the Scarlett MX was that although I really liked it, the jump to 4K wasn't as big a leap to my eye as I thought it was going to be. Was it sharper than the soft 1080p from the 5D Mark II? Sure. But it wasn't quite the difference that I expected to pop out at me and slap me in the face. In fact, many would argue skin tones are noticeably better, more true to life on the 5D than the Red MX. What I found made the RED so great was its compressed raw R3D workflow. I could push and pull the images. I'm shot on that camera in a way I never could with the 5D due to its severe H.264 compression. We later bought a Scarlet W housing RED's incredible Dragon sensor as a new ACAM that gave us higher frame rates, better color separation, better IR protection, a noticeably wider dynamic range and more resolution being 5K. The latter of these, the resolution jump made very little difference to our work, whereas the higher frame rates, vastly improved IR protection, improved color separation and color science and highlight latitude made a concrete, visible difference in work for our clients. It made our work better, it made our jobs easier, minus the slower boot time than the Scarlett MX. In 2012, the need for cameras that booted up faster, had internal NDs and decent onboard audio built in, uh, led us to move away from RED to Black Magic Design's Ursa Mini Pro G2 with a Pocket 6K as a companion. Our cheapest ever cinema camera purchase is also the one with the highest resolution. Advocates of high 4K plus resolution talk about the benefit of punching in on a shot to stabilize or tighten the frame, I agree. Um, I use both of those crutches in post on fast moving corporate and doco style content. I may punch in to cover a cut uh, in an interview or to stabilize a shot that was a bit wonky. Recently we shot a campaign being finished at 1080 in 4.6K and all the interview shots needed float on them, I framed a bit wider and I did it in post. Keeping the camera locked down the whole time when we were actually shooting. So having that extra resolution is handy for sure, but it's not a crutch I'm constantly or usually leaning on. And yes, I know Fincher stabilizes in post and he is amazing, I agree. But for us, when it comes to narrative content, we're shooting the shot we planned. Our framing is composed very deliberately and we rarely reframe or crop in in post. I'm not saying we don't ever, but it's not common. What I'm getting at is that resolution matters, sure, but beyond a certain point, it's diminishing returns. Color science, IR protection, dynamic range, even sensor sensitivity have come to sit far higher on my priority list. It's not the pixel count, but the quality of the pixels that counts. Now compared to modern cameras, the sensitivity of the Alexa Classic isn't anything special at all, but we aren't buying it to be a shoot in the dark camera. We bought an Alexa Classic to primarily shoot narrative content and corporate interviews on sticks, both of which have been lit and the former of which would generally have an AC assisting. 
I'd actually been entertaining the idea of purchasing an Amira, but with everything the Ursa G2 does so well, for faster paced on the shoulder corporate and commercial work, we couldn't justify the expense. But knowing Shane and I both coveted the Alexa image, when I found on Red User of all places, a classic with less than 850 hours on it going for 5K US, with eight memory cards, EF, NPL mount, and everything we need to shoot, we couldn't help it. But for us to make the most of this beautiful tool, we've incurred some other expenses. And these are a few of the things you need to think about before pulling the pin on a used Ari Alexa purchase. So here's the cons. Number one, no warranty. Expect expensive repairs if something goes wrong. Also make sure you are buying from a reputable person. Number two, this camera is a beast. It's built like a tank, which is quite reassuring. Where did you find this? In a box under my seat. Are they heavy? Yeah. Then they're expensive, put them back. Weighing 13.9 pounds or 6.3 kilograms for the body alone, your current set of sticks may not be enough. Our Satchler FSB8 on a Flotec 75 maxes out at nine kilograms. Put an EVF monitor, map box and wireless follow focus on there, plus a lens, we'd be struggling. We'd be over that for sure. So we've forked out for a refurbished Vinton Vision 100 millimeter fluid head and a carbon fiber sticks uh, with a 20 kilogram weight limit. I don't mind spending money on tripods because they can be serviced and last a long time. These go for 6K US and we bought it refurbished with sticks for a little over 2K US. We also bought an ergo rig for handheld shooting and we'll have a separate review for that down the track once we've used it more. To be fair, the ergo rig isn't just for this camera. We've been looking out for a camera back support system that allowed us to navigate doorways for some time, but the Alexa certainly was the instigator of the purchase. Number three, having relied mainly on internal NDs of the G2, uh, we just have some Tiffin screw-on NDs that we pair with a good Hoya UVIR filter on the 6K and the X-T3 for branded content. It's not really going to cut it for the narrative work we're planning, so we ordered three Nissi IR ND filters in two, four, and seven stops. The prices add up. Number four, if we want to record 2.8K ARRI RAW, we need to buy a convergence design, Gemini or Odyssey 7Q or 7Q+, Plus, all of which are discontinued, necessitating another used purchase. This is probably an inevitable purchase at some point, in which case perhaps we should just bite the bullet and buy one now, but we'll just stick with the beautiful downsampled ProRes 2K for the time being. This is a bit of a con for sure, no internal raw on this model, but it was only five grand. But when I did my B-Roll versus ProRes test, and I'll link to that video below, our ProRes HQ held up amazingly well to rigorous grading, better than expected in all but the most extreme of errors, which was by putting my tint and my white balance as far separate and out as possible and trying to correct that in post. Not something that typically goes unnoticed on a shoot. Number five, the Classic or EV doesn't have a four-way three mode for anamorphic shooting. It's a 16 by nine camera. The 2.8K is 2880 by 1620, not 2880 by 2160 of later models. Now, although we think anamorphic is cool, a great choice for some projects, both Shane and I actually generally prefer spherical lenses. It just draws less attention to itself, which we like, and that's a subjective thing. But yeah, no anamorphic mode could be a deal breaker for you, but it isn't for us. Number six, because we're still using the Ursa G2 all the time, we needed some extra rosette arms to shoot off the shoulder and we needed an RE standard dovetail plate um, just to put the thing on sticks, um, both of which we bought from small rigs. So not really negatives, but additional expenses. Number seven, there's no decent onboard audio recording. That just isn't. And number eight, this thing chews through batteries like Jaws chewed through Quint. <laughs> So I guess the biggest con is the associated hidden expenses you need to really use this camera fully. You may already have all of these bases covered, in which case, awesome. Um, but if you've been shooting on lightweight cameras or cameras with internal NDs, um, chances are you've got some additional expenses coming your way. You know, the pros are much more simple. This sensor can shoot spectacular images due to its industry-leading color reproduction and wide usable dynamic range. Um, with the high-speed license, which we have, it can shoot 120 FPS uh, in 1080p. That's gonna be great for commercials. It uh, records ProRes HQ and ProRes 4444 internally, 
Um, the body itself is affordable now. Ours was cheaper than a Canon C70. Um, and although we couldn't, as a business, justify the expense of an Amira today, we purchased this Alexa also as a future B cam to an Amira or Mini, both of which we expect the prices to come down on when Ari's Super 35 4K camera starts hitting shelves. Though I wouldn't anticipate uh, that purchase by us for another one or two years. Time will tell if we've made a good decision here. There's definitely an element of, oh, we just really want one. Even if a C300 Mark III, an FX9 or an FX6 make more business sense, as they are far better all-rounders and single operator cameras. But our Blackmagic and Fuji cameras are currently fulfilling our corporate content needs really well. Like eventually we'll jump on a camera with IBIS for super fast light handheld shooting. Maybe an A7S III is in our future, but I digress. We got an Alexa for narrative work. Primarily our own original short films, which is a big focus for us over the next couple of years. The Alexa is not for shooting branded content. I say this now anyway, it'll probably work its way more and more into our corporate work. But anyway, the point is we didn't buy a used Alexa to be our do everything camera. It's not that. It's too heavy, burns through too many batteries too quickly, doesn't have internal NDs or decent onboard audio recording. If I had to choose between this and our Ursa G2 as our only camera, I'd take the Ursa G2 because it's faster to work with for a single operator in a wide variety of situations. If you are purchasing one A camera that you need for a variety of shooting styles and conditions, this absolutely isn't it. It's designed to be used with a crew. If you, like I was, are eyeing off Alexa Classics online as the prices continue to fall, I absolutely wouldn't get this if it was going to be your only camera unless your focus is almost purely on narrative cinematography. But if it's to be one of a mix of cameras that you use for different projects and shooting scenarios and want to bring that Alev 3 magic to your more planned work, you know, narrative films, music videos and long form interviews, well then 10 years after the Alexa hit the market, the colour science of this camera still blows my mind. It's a sensational tool that when used as intended with a crew, well its reputation and work history speaks for itself. We can't wait to shoot our first short on it soon. What do you think of our decision? What place do you think the Alexa Classic has amongst today's modern cameras like the FX9, C300 Mark III and even the A7S III? What do you think about purchasing a 2 or 2.8K camera in 2021? I'd love to chat with you in the comments below, so don't be shy. Uh, and if you got some value out of this, please you know, go do the YouTube things and that's it. Cheers, see you later, bye.